because of the organization's co-founder, which is Scott Fine, who should be joining us any minute now. And we'll, we'll be talking to him a little bit about how he started the organization. But Scott, even though he was just a pet parent who went through some very tragic stuff, he had the foresight to know that if he was going to start this organization, he needed to have some backup. And so he's collected a whole bunch of wonderful, wonderful veterinarians and attorneys to help guide us through uh, getting some laws changed and also understanding what goes on in veterinary practices. And so we also have with us Dr. Can Canizero. How are you? Am I, did I pronounce that wrong? Oh, no, you, you did a great job. You did a really good job. <laughs> I always worry about that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. And Jerry, thanks always for being here. Jerry's with us every week. How are you? I think we have a little bit of spottiness on, on, on your, uh, your Wi-Fi, but we'll just, we'll just go a little bit and talk a little bit while we're waiting for our attorneys, uh, our attorney to come in and as well as Scott, but I'm going to talk a little bit with you, uh, Dr. Canizero. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you've seen. So I think one of, I want to talk a little bit about the struggles we're having as far as getting this organization going. Scott and Jerry know we are struggling to get the donations together to do this. And I think one of the reasons that we struggle is because people don't even know if they've been a victim of veterinary malpractice or that it does actually happen. I think a lot of times people don't realize that. So I always ask the vets if they've ever, what your thought is on that. Have you ever seen veterinary malpractice? Um, I, I have, and I think you're right that there are many instances where people don't realize that they've been a victim of malpractice. And I worked in a very busy practice where I saw some things that were much less than ethical, but I, I didn't own the practice and I didn't feel that I could necessarily stand up, challenge the owner of the practice. I was basically an associate, well, I wasn't quite an associate, but I was a part-timer, but oh, we lost Jerry. <laughs> so um, I, I think we scared Jerry clear off. And uh, so I, I think that that's definitely a problem. And, and I don't know if people are a little bit afraid uh, to jump in as far as um, fundraising for what I think is a really important um, thing to, you know, contribute toward um, because people and animals deserve to have a voice and deserve to be heard. And, you know, I feel I'm in a difficult situation because I am a veterinarian. So veterinarians do make mistakes um, and the handling of those mistakes in some of the previous podcasts we've had together um, are, I have a different, the attorneys do because I've been you know, a veterinarian. And so I know what I've been told and um, how we're supposed to proceed. And we really have, if it starts from a breakdown of communication, um, then in addition to that, what cascades from that is if there is an upset or a conflict between the client, it becomes really difficult to navigate that terrain. And I feel I'm a very transparent individual. Um, and, you know, sometimes by our attorneys. Well, you know, be careful, don't speak to them or, and of course, as, as a empath and as a very compassionate veterinarian, that's a really hard thing to do. Um, if there seems to be a conflict or dispute, but on the other hand, we as veterinarians don't want things to go down a cascading road where a client being upset about something legitimate that happened. In other words, legitimate where no wrongdoing did occur. Um, because that happens a lot too. I think the other thing that's extraordinarily difficult as I've looked at some of these cases that have come my way um, is that we have veterinary records and we don't have um, at the veterinary practices. So when I have records, I can't really do anything but assume that the correct information is in that record take into consideration what the client's experience had been and what the client explicit, explicitly has said they've been told directly. And of course, I have a tendency to believe the client. Um, there's always truth on both sides, but I have a tendency to believe the client. And sometimes you can see that 
even in the record where maybe things started to get twisted around after that to make it look maybe not as as you know bad or uncomfortable as it actually was so um how we overcome that uh clients you know if they have legitimate concerns and that that's a difficult one one really hope we can tackle this evening is something that's going to make uh hopefully all of you not uncomfortable is a lot of times when i'm looking at these records because i'm a holistic homeopathic veterinarian this is something that is incredibly not spoken about and is very difficult to touch and that diseases and what i mean by that is that many and most of the animals and cases that come to me actually have veterinary caused diseases the thing that's incredibly hard is that because it's traditional or allopathic medicine it is considered standard of care to do generally speaking what they have done to the animal and yet the client is paying dividends for that and without mentioning names for example a client came to me with a dog not very old and uh, presented for mast cell cancer. This was the second uh, arrival of the mast cell cancer. The first uh, tumor was removed and they continued to vaccinate the dog. Now, I know that that is going to bring mast cell cancer back. Not only as a veterinarian who understands uh, immunology, and I understand it's bad medicine to vaccinate an animal that has a serious medical condition. And so sure enough, the mast cell cancer came back again. In searching through the records, which I always ask for, I could find no other apparent reason for this dog to you know, suddenly come up with mast cell cancer. There wasn't a long history of ailments and illnesses and things. So the client now is in a very difficult situation where now the cancer is inoperable. Uh, they've come to me hoping maybe there's something that I can do. I'm certainly gonna work my hardest to do it. And I'm faced too with, you know, a veterinary caused disease, in my opinion. But I think it goes beyond my opinion. I mean, it was a bad thing the dog. And wouldn't you know, no. only just a few months later, when the dog was apparently cancer free, now has a recurrence of the cancer in relatively the same side of the tail instead of the one side. So the other side doesn't make any difference. So I don't know how clients tackle that, but if we're quiet about um, then clients are going to continue to pay a tremendous money and lose their pets to veterinary caused diseases, whether it's flea and tick poisons, over vaccinating, uh, getting or medications, maybe not even with proper follow up and blood work and diagnostics to make sure that the animal is medications. There's many medications, including Ad, um, Apoquil, Atopica, Cytopoint. I, I'm treating cancer all over the place from those drugs. That's veterinary induced disease. So what are we going to do, even though the pharmaceutical companies have a big share to pay in this? I attorneys out there, uh, what can you consider doing um, to help the public and animals to get yeah. out of suffering in this? I think it goes beyond a homeopathic holistic veterinarian. Yeah. These are truly veterinary induced diseases that the clients pay a tremendous amount of money to try to treat the consequences of. And many of these animals um, go on to suffer and die um, as a result. So um, I want to I want to put that out there and I really want to push the attorneys on it. So, yeah, I think that that's um, Lauren. Like I just want to introduce Lauren, who's our attorney for this evening. Lauren Turner. Hi, how are you? Nice Hello. to see you again. Nice to see you too, Carrie. Hi, Robin. Nice to meet you. So we're gonna. I think. I think what you're. Uh, what we need to look at is the beginning stages, which is what we're in. Right, is first passing the laws that these animals are not property, and then because I'm, I'm exactly like you, Dr. Canazero. I that's these in, veterinary induced diseases are far more common than the. I don't want to minimize the accidental death of a dog when something happens, but the because mm -hmm. those happen also and also need to be addressed as malpractice. But I think we have these steps we have to take before we can get to the to the what I think and I think we both agree is probably the bigger bigger picture is how many animals are getting sick and dying that I agree with you are induced by the veterinarian itself. But uh, before we get too far into that, 
Lauren, I always, always want to make it really, really clear. I know I asked this at the beginning of every show because the questions will come in. So can you just tell us really quickly what veterinary malpractice is so we can define it straight up out, out the starting gate? Sure. Um, so it's it's a loaded question. I mean, vet med mal, <laughs> you know, because I, 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 you know, I don't know if you guys know, but, but I'm actually working with Carrie on, I'm, I'm going to bring her in as an expert on one of my cases, um, not for vet med mal, but as, as you were talking about Robin for the, the flea and tick issue, um, you know, so, so I am varied, but vet med mal really has to be, um, I mean, by definition, it has to be something that uh, uh, leaves, goes away from the standard practice of care. So, um, and it's hard to prove because you basically have to get another veterinarian to look at what some other veterinarian did and say, oh gosh, no, like that was way out of, out of character. Like that, that's not do it. And veterinarians are very, um, I, I think that there is an, an within the industry, C certainly within, you know, I, I, we have a vet med mal board uh, and they, they investigate and it's very hard to prove did something that's outside of the, the standard practice. And, and so, I mean, that voted, um, but for that reason, it's, it's really, really hard to prove because these are professionals and, and just like I'm, you know, run by the, the, the Florida bar veterinarians are run by a board of veterinary professionals. And, and to get one professional to look at another and say, that never could have happened to me. I never would have done that is a really high standard and a really high bar. So, yeah. um, it's, it's tough. Um, where it's really clear cut. I, I have one I'm going to call you in a couple of days, Carrie. I have a veterinarian who was uh, kicked by a horse and openly admits to being and not sleeping very well because of the amount of pain that he was in. And he did surgery on a dog while in a wheelchair, but didn't like adjust. So, so you have like these clear cut cases and they really have vet med mal because it, it, it's we're we're lawyers we're not doctors and for really good right. reasons <laughs> so um yeah that was the most roundabout horrible answer to a really clear-cut question because it's a really roundabout issue well, i always ask it because i i've worked in the veterinary field for many 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 years and i know that people think that if the animal dies in a veterinary hospital it's the vet's fault end of story yeah. and so I want it to be really clear before people start hiring attorneys and going after their veterinarian that you really, really need to have a good attorney look at your case. And the attorney is like, uh, like Lauren are perfect because she's really involved with Joey's legacy. But if you get the wrong attorney who just, you know, wants to take your case and doesn't really understand and you have an emotional, you have an emotional <laughs> pet parent and you have a, you know, a attorney, you could end up just making situations worse for everybody. So I really want people to understand before we get involved in this and have, because the next step, what Joey's Legacy does, for those of you who are listening, is you would send in an email and it would go right away to one of the veterinarians. So uh, Dr. Canzanero, you get these and then you look at them, correct? Yes, that's correct. And I, I want to touch on uh, what Lauren said. I'm not sure if Lauren was on when we had just started. Mm -hmm. A lot of the difficulties we have in reviewing these records is that we don't have any witnesses, client, mm -hmm. and what the veterinary records say. And as a veterinary professional, I don't mind speaking any truth. But if there isn't a really obvious uh, bad judgment on the veterinarian's part, it's really difficult. We can't climb into that vet's head and we can't know exactly what they said and exactly what they did. We have a paper record, which is incredibly linear. It just doesn't really fulfill. And I feel bad for a lot of the clients because I feel like I'm never really going to get at the truth for them. In other yeah. words, that there looks like maybe at a minimum, there's been bad communication 
Um, and there may be something much greater than that uh, that occurred or that happened. And it makes it really difficult because I'd like to do whatever I can for them. Um, so I, I tell them what I do see and what I do find. And there are some things that I think uh, are big, big misses, you know, that I think a veterinarian should have noticed an animal that's hospitalized and the temperature's too low. Mm. An hour and a half later, they send the pet home. Um, that I mean, doesn't feel really right to me. You know, if they say, well, wait a minute, that would be a really big red flag for me. You know, why would they do that? Um, but there's all that missing information. Did they take another temperature before the pet went home and never logged it in? I don't know. You know, all I can say is what I'm seeing on the um, and what the client has to say. And I know that the client is emotionally charged. So, you know, it's difficult there too, because you have all the emotional charge and they feel very certain that there's been a wrongdoing. We as veterinarians do lose patients, um, expectedly and unexpectedly. And it necessarily mean that we did something wrong. This is something in the veterinary world that no veterinarians that I've ever been around discuss that we lose patients, uh, uh, you know, not thank God, not very many, but I've lost patients. Most of the ones that I've lost, I was shocked and surprised. I expected not the extremely elderly, frail that you're holding your breath and basically turning blue yourself because you're panicked about putting them under anesthesia. And those guys wake up and they're doing fine. Um, some of them are young, seemingly vital, doesn't make any sense. Um, most, at least the ones for me anyway, were, were death. Uh, with anesthesia. And the number also, one call I get. What's is, that? The yeah. number one call I get is when they go under for the teeth cleaning. Yep. They just people cannot understand how they brought their dog in to get their teeth cleaned and now it's dead. I'm you are so on on accurate on that one. That is the I it come four times a yeah. yeah. And that, that was what... one of the ones that I lost, Lauren. And uh, but that one wasn't that shocking. It was an extremely fractious cat. I explained to the client that I was absolutely going to be unable to do pre-anesthetic blood work. And the only way that I was going to get blood work on the cat was once I induced anesthesia. And there's always a risk of anesthesia. But what I want to put out there, um, and unfortunately, that cat had chronic renal disease. I didn't know because I couldn't do the <clears> blood work until he was already on the and I, he, I did lose him under anesthesia. But what I want to say that I think is incredibly important, and I hope your listeners will hear this a thousand fold, please, no matter what your veterinarian says, if your pet goes in for an x-ray and they want to sedate uh, or teeth cleaning and they want to do anesthesia, you need to understand that anesthesia is a serious procedure. And when veterinarians, my colleagues are minimizing it, oh, it's just a dental, it's time for your, oh, it's National Dental Month. Mm -hmm. come on in. Some of them only have staining on the teeth. They don't even need to be put under. But whatever the case be, you need to understand that anesthesia for any reason, I don't care if it's a spay, a neuter, something routine, something we do a billion times, it doesn't, a dental thing doesn't matter. They don't have a heart murmur. They seem fine. It's a serious procedure. So think carefully about anesthesia and whether your vet minimizes it or not, understand that it is very serious and potentially dangerous procedure. And when it needs to be done, my personal opinion is that anesthetic dental should only occur if they have an abscess tooth. And right. you know, we can't take it out without anesthesia, not to polish the teeth up nice and pretty and clean. There are alternatives for that. Well, oh, anyway, thank you so much for saying that. that. That's so, one of the reasons why I fight so hard for preventative, right? Feed right. them healthy, you know, right. brush the teeth, do what you have to because you'll find yourself in that situation. So that's my little, please, please make sure that no you- No matter what, or get another opinion, but think yeah. seriously about anesthesia. You know, I, I, I can't say that enough because most of the animals we're going to lose are not the tricky surgeries. They're the yeah. dental, the spays, the neuters. Um and again, sometimes it is the fault of the vet, the one that I worked for that I told you about, was anesthesia, put the cat in a kennel, walked away, went back to go get the cat for the neuter, and the kitty was dead in the kennel. Somebody should have been observing that kitty. Mm -hmm. But again, I didn't feel compelled to be able to say anything, you know, and uh, that was a long time ago. There's things I probably would have done differently. But uh, please understand that, uh, and, and the owner was probably fed 
some kind of whatever I don't want to say, but probably yeah. not the honest truth. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, I think that that is a mistake that I've personally witnessed veterinarians do and vet techs do this where the client comes in and the dog needs to have his teeth or the cat needs to have his teeth clean. I've heard it from receptionists and vet techs say, oh, it's perfectly safe. It's fine. I, no. Like, why would you set somebody up for that? They, you're, you're not giving them full disclosure so that they well, can make. Furthermore, right. most of them, as I said, uh, Carrie, it, they, they don't even need the dental cleaning. I mean, oh, if I've they, seen that they have an access tooth or a tumor in there or something like that. That's another matter. But some yeah. stain or you know a little bit of plaque. I'm sorry. There's better ways to do that. Thank yeah. you so yeah. much for saying it. Major pet plan out there that pushes for annual cleanings. Yep. My dogs have been part of it, part of my wising Ooh. up to it. And and it's, I mean, almost everybody I speak to, every probably 40, no lie, 40% of people that, that give me a call ha, have this particular pet plan. And and they the difference between level to, you know, paying $50 a month and paying level three, paying $70 a month per dog is that annual dental cleaning. And that's just the number one way to keep your dog longer. And it's, wow. yeah, Absolutely. I've seen no, pushing no for it. Nobody that I have ever encountered has ever suggested that. Um, oh, I, I've, I've seen, seen it too, Laura. I, I'm so glad you're saying that. Honestly, I, I think have 10 people watching this podcast right now, all 10 have just learned probably the number one way that, that I, the number one reason I have people call me that yeah. and blood work, you, you, you brought up blood work. I I've got a lot of people who call that, that, you know, the veterinarians relied on blood work that was over five to seven days old. Wow. You know, it's gosh, the really, really common one I get is, um, the male cats, and I don't know, Dr. Canizaro, it's male cats and they, they start having blockages, urinating, and it's a really common procedure. And they basically take right. the male genital and make it into a female genital in order well, to, to stop. A major, it's a major surgery. Um, essentially yeah. Make a boy cat a girl cat is essentially what they do. Uh, but it's a, veterinary. I mean... It, it's it's super well common. nowadays what i have experienced is that uh, if a cat blocks once um they're already talking about that pu surgery it's called a pu surgery but i won't go into the details of the length of it length of the name of it and um uh, and i said well why one time one time or maybe twice um when i was practicing that kind of med oh my gosh 20 years ago or something I never even thought about recommending that unless it was a really intractable case. Um, I would, I can't even remember recommending doing the PU surgery, which again is a major surgery. And by the way, if you think they can't block once they're made into a girl cat, absolutely. So, and it doesn't cure the disease either because the underlying disease is not getting fixed by making the urethral opening bigger. So if we don't fix it through diet, or natural medicine means, I promise they're going to go on and have additional problems. My That's experience of over exactly. 20 years, 25 years or so, is most of these cats that have chronic lower urinary tract disease will eventually go on to have uh, chronic kidney disease and kidney failure later mm -hmm. in life. Watch, because I don't think there's no scientific data on that, but I see it year after year after year after year. There is absolutely a connection. There's reasons for that too, because I'm trained in Chinese medicine and homeopathy. So we understand the reasons why that is, but I promise you that you can expect that down the pike if curative medication, curative medicine isn't put into play, um, in, you know, in enough time. Hmm. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. I have, I wanted to, add, this is a kind of a two part question. First part to Dr. Canzanero and then to you, Lauren, is there any, for your license, does the veterinary board or does anybody state anywhere that you have to have cameras when you were talking about witnesses? Do you guys have to have cameras in your your hospitals at all? Do you know? No, not at all, to my knowledge. Not at all. And then the second part, Lauren, would be, is there a way to get that law passed? Because I just really believe that boarding facilities, groomers, daycares, you know, we have 
animals that can't talk and we're going to have to rely on witnesses. Is there some way to get that law passed in order for licenses? You know, there was, and I, I think I might've brought this up the last time I was here. There was a big letter recently, um, a, a hall had, had been sexually abusing animals at his practice amongst other things. I mean, this was a huge story. Um, wow. And, and, I, we, we were on channel 10 and we were talking about it and, and it, it, I didn't think about it before I said it, but some, some with COVID the veterinary offices started having people sit in the, the parking lots and then bring the animals inside. And so you've kind of lost that ability, you know, short of it being, you know, catastrophic and you're there to, you know, put your dog down, you lost the ability to sort of have eyes on it. And I thought, if we can't be there with our animals, why would they not have put up? I mean, I have, you know, cheapy little funny cameras in my house that that I put towards both my doors. And whenever I want to log in, I log in. I, it just can't be that hard. I don't know that there's any law. I mean, it would be on our thing to pass even statewide because it's it's really the practitioners are given so much leeway, but I, I do think that be, because we can't be there, good veterinarians would, would, would give us the option. Let us, let us see, let us watch. Cause it's such a simple, yeah. easy yeah. To, to make it law would be. Well, that is one of the things that I, you know, I did a podcast a while back about how to protect your animal from boarding daycare and grooming and veterinary mm -hmm. hospitals. And one of the things we talked about as far as a solution is to make sure that wherever you're going, there are cameras available yeah. and that they're willing to provide it to you in case you feel more comfortable seeing it. Because if they're not, then, you know, I, I mean, I'm not expecting cameras in every, I just had to show a camera, a video to somebody and there's little hallways that I don't have, you know, so we couldn't see the dog being, but in the main areas, I think, you know, like mobile groomers, for example, mobile. I, <laughs> they need to have the cameras in there. And I, I just think we should be able to get, if we can get, that's why I think it's so important. What Joey's legacy is doing is to get the laws passed that these are not prop that animals aren't property. Cause once we get them to be more than property, then I think we can open it up to more laws. Right. I'm pretty sure maybe you would know this Lauren. I don't know, but I think children's daycares have to have cameras. Oh yeah. Think, yeah. So if children's daycares, yeah have cameras then why wouldn't our pets for the because same reason they're, because they're prop because property say there are there are times when referring to pets as property versus like physical people so it's blanket you know i i e d intentional infliction of emotional distress damages except for like very very intense situations at least in my state not in most states there's it's really hard because animals are considered property to get emotional distress. Either like number one, insane situation where um, there was a, a garbage man that, that took a garbage can and like crushed a dog in front of its owner, just out of like pure malice. He, there was something wrong with the guy, but that is an example where he obviously intended to cause the distress. And so the court said, even though that's property, we're going to allow that IIED to come in. The other example was considered to be gross negligence. There was a veterinarian who had a dog pad and the dog was left on the heating pad too high overnight. And the dog experienced burns that were so severe that the dog had to be destroyed the following day. And so for that situation, the court allowed for IED. So the, not overcomable, like it's not not overcomable, but it's it's a high bar. But there are also more can bring because they're considered like breach of bailment. Breach of bailment is an amazing cause of action. It's available in all fifty states. And property to someone, and that someone is supposed to care for it. And if they don't, and you get the property back in like a different state, then you can, you can bring a cause of action. Right. So it's, it's meant for hammers. You loan somebody a hammer and they give it back to you without a handle, but because dogs are considered property, it's that breach of bailment to say, I trusted you with my property and you gave it back different. And that's given us this huge 
so there's there's a pro to it too whereas if it was considered like a like a kid a, a, the living being that it actually is which i am very much for but you know there's ways nobody's an animal law to make money okay we're in it because you're passionate about what it is so if there's a loophole to y'all will find it <laughs> That it's good to know. I mean, we all talk about the loopholes when we don't like it, but sometimes we ha we need them, and that's good to know. That's one thing we haven't talked about: is are there any loopholes that we're able to use? And that's awesome that we can do that. And for hopefully for anybody out there that doesn't end up getting to use one of the attorneys here or something happens, please you know at least contact us and let us know. Maybe Lauren can give us some more ideas on some loopholes in case it's not a case that you could take outside. You're in Florida, so you can only mm -hmm. practice in Florida, correct? Yeah, but I mean, breach of bail, like I said, something like breach of, vet med mal is so hard to prove. Like I like I was saying earlier when Dr. Canzanaro was saying, you know, we get these records and we have to look at them. And for a vet to say that really, the standard practice is, that's such a high bar. It's hard to get another vet to say that. It has to yeah. be pretty, but, and even negligence, to prove negligence, you would really have to have that, that letter from another vet. Basic things like breach of bailment is an old of action. It's been around since, I mean, it came from Britain. Those are the ones that you can use that are cut and dry. I gave you spot and he was alive and I got him back and he was dead. Yeah. And it's much easier. It's a much easier threshold to, to overcome. At least we have them. I had no, I was just thinking we have no loopholes. We have nothing. So I'm happy to hear that. We need that. I'm going to get to a couple of these questions that have come across. Um, well, I'm going to, the first one is, is um, for our vet. Have you ever heard of paleo pet raw? She's just curious if you've ever heard of that. Yes, yes, I have. Um, and raw food, basically, they're referring to high protein, raw diet. It isn't um, necessarily the best diet for everyone. And I highly recommend um, speaking with a homeopathic holistic um, because if you try to speak to most traditional allopathic veterinarians, um, they'll you know, they, they seem to be petrified of raw diets. I'm not sure why. Even the AVMA, to my knowledge, has really discouraged us from recommending any raw food diets. I have yet to know of any animal that died from a raw food diet, but I've known many that died from the commercial bag foods and canned foods. So I'm not sure why they're so scary, but um, I, I feed raw to uh to my own pets but i do give them grains and uh vegetables and uh things like that as well so make sure you seek out to look for a balanced diet raw food high protein diet i honestly think that the uh no grain diets and raw no grain diets are more bad, um and not necessarily for the majority of animals so seek out uh professional advice to get the best balanced diet and a lot of the diets out there are not balanced um, so I don't want to scare you away from them, but make sure that you're working with somebody that can really help you balance a diet for your pet because home prepared or raw food is by and away, uh, it, it, it's far superior to anything in a bag and anything in a can. Mm -hmm. I haven't met a good dry or canned food yet. I think there's other things. So that question came across from Jan Livingston. Um, I just would add to that, Jan, because, you know, I've been studying nutrition for a long time. And um, the other thing I always tell people about food is you, you have to do a little bit more research than just the, in, the what you see in the bag, but where they're sourcing it from, um, whether they're willing to be transparent with you about what they're putting in there. Uh, and it, there's just a lot more to it. So I, I can look into this for you later if you want. I'm kind of glancing at it right now. And of course, right off the top of my head, it seems like a fairly good diet, but I, there's so much more I'd have to do. I couldn't answer that question. Just very not, not all of these pre-prepared diets are balanced. So don't okay. assume just because it came from a company um, that, uh, that it is balanced. And to carry on a little bit with uh, uh, what uh, Carrie, Carrie's saying here as well, um, you know, some of these companies know that uh, the sourcing of the materials that they are getting for these foods are tainted in any way. Uh, they don't know because they're told the same as we're told, oh, it's healthy, it's good. 
we don't know unless you're making it yourself um, and you're sourcing ingredients yourself, you don't know whether it's a bag, a can or uh, pre food. Yeah. And I think um, I, at least I tell my clients, Jan, when, since we're going to talk about raw for a few minutes is make sure you're getting blood, regular blood tests done at your vet, because, you know, even, even the most balanced diet, let's say the most balanced diet that we could come up with your pet, your individual pet may not be synthesizing it, absorbing it, doing all of those things. So have your dogs tested and get their blood test and see a vet on build a relationship. So, so I always worry that people think, oh, I bought this balanced, complete and balanced diet and that's all my need to do. And now my dog is going to be eating a complete and balanced diet, but there's so much more to it than that. So I just want to put that out there, make sure you're getting those tests done with your vets and keeping a relationship going. Um, but let's look at some other questions here. So if someone becomes a victim of veterinary negligence and malpractice and requests copies of all records related to the care of their pet, what is the obligation and responsibility of the vet clinic in providing the requested documents and records? They have to give them right away. I mean, I, as soon as feasibly possible. Because there's um, the, and this is most states again, and this would be state law, not not federal, but the the law. Uh, if, if there's like a an overly long passage of time between the the request of the record because the records belong to to the client they don't belong to the physician or whatever there's they the the law will assume that the records have been fussed around with changed if, if there's too much. we have um oh gosh we just had a case and the vet just dead refused to give the records <laughs> i said them yeah uh there was so there's two kinds of records vets do now. One is like the electronic ones where like every time something happens, like the Banfield does it, right? Or vet tech walks into the room, they they put it in the computer and you get like a nice printout. There's also vets that do like the hand and they'll they'll strike, they'll remove. I mean, getting the printout with the the uh, Dr. Kanazar, do you know what it's called? I, I it's slipping slip of the tongue, but it's when there's like the name, the time, and the the thing. Well, there, versus there, there are computerized records, and as far as I know, most of the computers have features in them where you can't go in and edit anything. Um, I'm not computerized, so I have handwritten notes, and I promise you, if you ever come in contact with my notes, which I hope you don't, because that's not going to be a good sign. Um, it, it, my notes, I strike stuff out all the time during, during an appointment. Sometimes I start writing on the wrong pet's record and oh darn it. And I, oh, we'll see so-and-so's record. Or, you know, I wrote something down and I, you know, the client said, oh no, I didn't mean that. And so, so I have handwritten records and, um, but I do write pretty legibly, thank heavens. But with the computerized records, there is a list of services rendered, and then there are the more detailed records, which actually are entries of the doctor's examinations, assessments, differential diagnoses, treatment plan, or at least that's how it should appear, even in the computerized mm -hmm. record, or SOAP notes, S-O-A-P. All of us are supposed to be keeping SOAP notes, whether they're computerized records or they are handwritten records. Makes no difference. We're all supposed to provide that. And to your question, I work alone, so sometimes it might take me a little bit longer for uh, to get records. But in the state of Florida, by the Sunshine Law, under absolute obligation to provide any stitch of record that the client requests within a reasonable amount of time. The reasonable amount of time. Charge for that. Um, reasonable. The, the record's really always small. I usually don't charge for it. I mean, some people move, so they want their. I want to suggest everybody's asking records for me because it's all no. Digits. Well, so, but you're you're but, so uh, somebody thinks yeah. something goes sideways. They walk in and they're like, "Give me." They they might be going to to another vet, right? Or a, right. They need a referral. They need a consult. They'll walk in. If the vet's office is slammed and it's busy, and you're standing there and you're like, "Give them to me now," that's not reasonable because you have to. No, you it's have not. To that's correct. It's, correct. But if they're saying, "Well, we can't give them to you until," For example, the veterinarian reviews them. Well, I get that all the time. Wow. Or no. That's not a thing. You don't come back the next day after the vets had the chance to review them. Hard no. And and in that position, Dr. Kenazar, are you in Florida? I am. I'm in yeah, Florida. Okay. 
as a homeopathic veterinarian, I always ask for all the handwritten doctor's notes as far back yeah. as they had their baby for. And it's mm -hmm. not to necessarily scrutinize the veterinarian, but I haven't seen that animal um, through maybe 10 years time or whatever it is. I want to know what the veterinarian saw, thought, diagnostic tests were done. If I get a list of is rendered, it means nothing. To me. I don't know what the temperatures usually are, what the weights have been. I don't know those details. And that's important information of much more important information as well. Um, so yes, I am in Florida. And, um, and usually a client, I get that all the time where, well, uh, they said that I can't have the records until the vet reviews them. And I thought, where the hell did that come from? Excuse my French. And yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm usually the one copying my own records because, you know, sometimes I have an assistant available. Sometimes I don't. Otherwise, my assistant does it for me if I have, my, you know, an assistant. But I don't know where that comes does make because my records are my records. I don't really need to review them. I've already documented what I need to document or should have. And I think that's another big problem in veterinary medicine, which doesn't have enough oversight veterinarians getting to maybe two days later, a day later, uh, writing their soap notes. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to, all those patients that, how on earth are we going to remember uh, exactly what we did accurately? Uh, I, I take my notes <clears throat> during the appointment period. So, so is, there a, well. is there a, it's for it's 2165 here in Florida that says, what's that? It, uh, 474, 472 is the statute in, in Florida that says when you, the, the records are yours, they don't belong to the vet. The vet keeps them, but they're yours. Mm -hmm. And and you're, well, the, the magic sure words are that. reasonable amount of time. You, you make sure so people understand that we, we are obligated to keep the uh, original records. So you're entitled to a copy of the records, um, but we cannot part with originals, whether that's x-rays or uh, the written records or the computer record. Well, computer records doesn't matter. It's going to be a, a copy. Well, that box. makes sense. It doesn't matter. But we have to keep a record, and that's for everybody's benefit, uh, really. Right. Um, but you are entitled to a copy of your record. Every single thing that we have with regard to your pet, um, you're entitled to that at any time you want it, uh, within mm -hmm. a reasonable amount. Of time. So, Lauren, what would be considered like if you were standing in front of a judge and you said that the client couldn't get their records for seven days. Is that reasonable or unreasonable? What would you it's think the judge would be? It's unreasonable. No. What would be reasonable? 24 the, hours? Because the, the statute automatically will impart, like the statute states that the, the court, the, the law is going to presume that the records have been altered. I mean, that's a very layman's way of breaking it down, but the court is going to presume that the records have been altered if an unreasonable amount of time has passed. If you're standing there demanding them in the middle of a, a Monday when there's surgeries and things happening and you don't get them within five minutes, that's, you know, somebody saying, well, the vet needs to look in the now or waiting seven days. That's a long time for somebody to yeah. just get, if, if you stand there for, you know, the, the front desk person to, to head to the back and make the photocopies for you and bring them up. That's probably going to be on the up. Uh, right. Right. I, I mean, it would be a so, case basis, but, you know, sure. you, they'll they'll say something dumb usually, frankly. You know, you know it's like the, whoever's up front will usually say something really dumb. Yeah. No, come back tomorrow. Look at them first. The vet said no. Like, they will shove it on the vet, and then the vet has to answer for it later because they have their license on the line. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't see, like if, if you really want it, your, I mean, I've worked for so many vets, they should be able to give it to you by the end of the day, unless there's some kind of emergency with that vet. You know, if you really wanted it, a vet could finish up her day and say, okay, let me give you, she's got to chart them anyway. She's got to write them. So there shouldn't be a reason. I don't know that I can think of. I mean, I couldn't get everybody there probably the same day, but as a vet, I think I, if I had one client with a situation, I should be able to get their records the same day. Yeah. I would consider that to be reasonable. But like yeah. you said, not five minutes. So, um, you know, and some people don't, I just had a client the other day who call, had a problem and she wanted me to call her. And I told my receptionist to tell her I would call her at the end of the day because I call everybody back by the end of the day. And that wasn't acceptable to her. So she, 
you know, got a little upset. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the statutes are all substantially similar, but, but ours here in Florida says any records owner licensed under this chapter who makes an examination of or administers treatment or dispenses legend drugs to any may shall upon request of the client or the client's legal representative furnish in a timely manner without delays for legal review copies of all reports and records relating to such examination or treatment so if so somebody the uh, question follow-up question on this is what's the recourse that a client has and would you guys I say, if you have to, I just had a client who has actually sent her stuff into Joey's legacy. She could not get the records. They wouldn't let her see her cat. Her cat died in their care. They wouldn't let her see her cat. They would give her the records. They want your cat. They would give her the records. They won't call her back. I mean, this has gone on for weeks. And I told her to call the police, like get the cops over there and get them involved. Would you agree that that's, or should you just do nothing? Her recourse is, I mean, it raises the presumption of modification. I mean, it's just... In, in court now, their records that nothing bad happened or whatever are pretty much moot. I mean, they're nullified. Now it's a he said, she said, because they refuse to provide in a reasonable, timely manner or whatever it is that I just, you know what I mean? That verbiage is pretty standard across the board. Yeah, the, uh, your court that loses the ability to rely on those could have had they coughed them up timely. Yeah, because if you give it to them right away, you don't have time to falsify them. So they're just making their case. What you're saying is they're making their, the veterinarian would be making their case. You got to remember, you're dealing with either, if it's a bench trial, it's a jury trial, it's 12 people like like me, right? Even if, I like, I'm, I'm educated. I know nothing about medicine or medical. If those <laughs> medical records are compromised and they can't come in, I mean, what evidence am I looking at? It's what it's this person who I'm relating to who was a victim. And this doctor now has nothing to rely upon because because you know they 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 kicked the can, they pounded sand, they they messed up. Yeah. Uh, evidence is important. So the uh the loss of that evidence can be fatal to a, a veterinarian's defense. Yeah. Well, I think um, we, in the very beginning of this, before you came in, we were talking a lot about uh, what Dr. Mazzaro was saying is that these induced diseases that are coming about, do you think that if we, that we have a chance of getting, because you brought up the vaccines, that is just driving me crazy. I just, I had talked about it before where a client of mine, I see this all the time, but this one's just fresh. She brought her sick animal showing symptoms of a seizure. The veterinarian says, oh, well, um, let's wait and see if she has more. But while you're here, we'll give him a rabies vaccine. Whoa. So, yeah. Oh, you brought that up in the last yeah. one. Yeah. And wow. so, but now go forward yeah. a little bit. Not even two weeks had passed. And this dog is now in the emergency room in, in a seizure that they're having trouble getting the dog out of. So do you think that if we can get these laws passed, that they're not seen as animals, that we also have hope of of charging veterinarians for inducing disease because that vaccine made the situation worse for a while. And, and I, I gotta tell you when you go to go, okay, good. You go to hospital X and you get pers medicine, right? A week later, you still don't feel good, but you go to hospital Y and they Hospital Y doesn't know what Hospital X gave you. If if it's not happening for people, it's happening for animals. And so there are there are apparently new companies coming into play that are, are making changes on this. I, I know there's a big one in Texas coming up and running right now where where you know all the medical records are gonna be, be linked and connected, but that's not the norm yet. And it 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 if it's not for it, does that answer? Yeah, it does. It makes me and probably Dr. Canzanero know that we just got to keep fighting the fight and teaching clients and pet owners to be more of your pet's advocate. You're going to have oh, to yeah. be. You're going to have to think about if your dog is having a seizure, why would you give the dog an... She doesn't even know why she's having the seizure yet. No tests were done. Nothing's done. Why would you then 
say, well, Maybe while you're a here, major injection too. I mean, baby shots are not. Yeah. A rabies vaccine of all things. A well, I think um, I, that's an excellent example. And I, I, as far as I'm concerned, if that one came across my desk, I honestly wouldn't have any trouble saying that there's something extraordinarily wrong here. Even whether you are a homeopathic veterinarian or allopathic veterinarian, exactly. which means traditional medicine, the vaccine inserts say to be used in healthy animals only. A dog that has a history of seizures, and you're going to find on my website, for example, I give a list on my website, if anybody wants to go there, of common ailments that you should uh, avoid any vaccination. Seizures, of course, is one of them. I would argue to you that that not only is a veterinary-induced disease, but is one where the veterinarian uh, used extraordinarily poor judgment to give a dangerous medication and then you know, in, in a case, in a situation where the probability is extraordinarily high um, that you're going to make the seizure situation worse um, or make it maybe even intractable to treat. And, you know, again, that's an enormous loss and an enormous expense. And I don't want to bring it all down to money, but it makes me angry that people are having to spend so much money to mop up the veterinary induced diseases. That's exactly but this what one in particular that you are talking about, I think does rise to poor judgment. I can't tell you because it would depend on the board and the board position, whether they would decide that that was, um, you know, rose to um, the, you know, poor standard of care. I, I can't say that I'm not an attorney. I think it would. I think it's negligence. Be. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, I, I feel that it is negligent. Um, if I were an allopath, and I'd be pretty nervous to want to vaccinate a dog like that, period. It's not yeah. just I didn't come out of the womb or out of veterinary school being a homeopath. I was doing traditional medicine for uh, years prior to doing this. I haven't lost or forgot my training. And to go on and to do something like that, uh, I think is, uh, I, I think it's, it should be actionable in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think it should be too. I actually think that even if a, a, well, that's the start of veterinary generated diseases, that is the start of it. Uh, if Absolutely. Lauren's listening carefully, that is the start of it. But uh, some of the other things that I could cite uh, might be a little bit more difficult to tackle. Yeah. But I think even um, for people who are listening, if you aren't going to go after the the possible legal that we can get, even though we're all going to agree. I think that's absolutely was not done. It was the poor judgment at, at the least it was poor judgment, right. but if this client yeah. doesn't go out the legal hopes that she can, you know, recoup some money from the emergency room or dog had to spend the night in the emergency room, there's all this stuff going on now. You still need to go back to that vet and at least put it in their head that you think that's what caused it. And maybe just maybe just that will make the vet think twice before they do it. I don't know, but we have to keep talking. We have to do something. But she doesn't want to say anything to the vet because nobody wants to make any waves. And yet these animals are continuing to get these vaccines. Even like you said, even though it says for healthy, that's why I brought up what's reasonable. I hate when we leave these little interpretations open because the bad guys, or like Scott likes to say, the bad actors will take advantage of that, right? So the animal wasn't having a seizure while she was in her office. She wasn't vomiting or diarrhea. She didn't have a temperature. So that vet claimed her, deemed her healthy enough for a rabies vaccine. Even though she went in saying she had a seizure, she thinks it was a seizure a couple hours ago. Well, uh, make no mistake, those inserts in the vaccinations are 1,000 because what those inserts do essentially is absolve the pharmaceutical company from any recourse whatsoever. It puts it entirely and squarely on the veterinarian who, as you say, is charged with deciding whether or not that animal is healthy enough to receive a vaccination. And then sadly, um, it could be that the board would decide just what you said. Um, oh, well, you know, they, they weren't vomiting or having diarrhea. Or there was no seizure on the day of the vaccination. And so it, sh it should be, it's okay. It's within standard of care. I would yeah. argue it's not. Um, yeah. it's, it's, she didn't, she, if you think about it, she said, I don't know. Let's see what happens. So she was still under her care of let's right. wait and see 
if we have another seizure and then we'll run some tests. So during that period, at least during that period, she should have said, let's do nothing until we find out what caused this. Exactly. Or at least do a workup. Let's do some blood work. Something. Um, something. Um, the other thing I want to say to listeners, which is incredibly important, and you said it yourself, Carrie, you really must go back and report an adverse event. I want you to know that there are so few adverse events actually documented for any of the vaccinations because nobody wants to make waves. The veterinarians don't want to report it. You need to insist or report it yourself. You need to do it because even if we don't consider it a wrongdoing, we could give a vaccination to a pet that we do feel is extensively healthy and they could still have an adverse uh, reaction or event. Right. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we use poor judgment. We have to document these things so that we can have fair and complete transparency about the safety and efficacy of any given vaccination. And yeah. if you're doing anything, then, uh, and this includes flea and tick medications, Heartworm prevention, generally speaking, although not all of them tend to be fairly safe, but you know, I don't want to go there really here because they're not that safe, but they're they're not as bad as some of the other the flea and tick stuff, et cetera. But you need to report these things, otherwise, it absolutely is not documented. And then the company can absolutely say, Well, look how safe our product is. There's just no adverse event. That's and the problem. Nobody dot nobody all wants of to make things. All of these things are studied for a minimal period of time. So whether you're talking about flea or tick poisons or whatever, there's like a six week study, maybe at best. I'm gonna assure you that the majority of individuals are gonna react badly to a medication is gonna be well beyond six weeks time. And it will be with multiple uses, even though they might try really doses in this six week period, there's a small pool that is actually taken and the period of time for the study is very short, unreasonably short. And so therefore, to suggest that these things are perfectly safe, whether it's a vaccination or, you know, whatever, uh, just be aware that the majority of these things either aren't tested or are tested a very short period of time, very small pool. I don't know, Warren, are you aware of that too? To, to add to that, and it, this is so important, and Carrie knows because this, this is something she and I are working on right now, something that's deemed safe for a dog is not necessarily deemed safe for a cat. Like we have Absolutely. a case where a cat catastrophic, horrific some mobile groomer, again, an unregulated thing, used a dog flea and tick medic shampoo. And, oh. and that they are no, that's a no. So, you know, it and, has to be reported because it, yeah, it just even and the other problem too is people are waiting for the instant reaction right so they think oh i went in i got a rabies vaccine he was fine for three days and it was all it was four days later that couldn't possibly be the case that is not true you need to i always tell people and maybe dr casanero would go even further back but i say anytime someone comes to me and says hey he just had an ear infection and he hasn't had one in years i say what happened within the last two weeks Tell me what happened within the last two weeks. And nine times out of 10, I get, oh, he got vaccinated. Oh, he got dewormed. Oh, he got, and then I'm like, well, there, there, there it is. But a lot of times they're looking for the instant. Like it has to, if it's a bad reaction, it had to be instant. And that's not always the case. I usually look back, I'm, I'm going to find a correlation from my perspective. When I'm re reviewing records, I'm going to look for something that's within two months. Um, yeah. And sometimes even three months. Once yeah. it starts to get closer to six months, I can convince that there's been an influence perhaps, but I think that gets, that starts to get a little bit long where it's an absolute, yeah. but, but that's yeah. getting a little farther out than what we can say. But if your pet has something terrible happen, a tumor come up or, um, you know, a, a reaction, a behavior change, and people don't realize vaccine <laughs> patients can cause behavior changes. Those right. are also, not just the physical ones, vomiting, diarrhea, skin outbreaks, uh, ear infections, um, but even behavior changes, mm -hmm. um, even yeah. oral disease, et cetera. All of those can be tied to some of the things we are doing in veterinary medicine. Um, uh, if it's within two months, that's pretty compelling as far as I'm concerned. If I'm looking yeah. at a record, I'm going to find it very compelling and even pretty darn compelling at three months' time. And anything it, soon? Really? At 60 or 90 days? It could be a that that correlation to be 
evidentiarily. No, I was a homeopathic veterinarian, but truthfully, I can go. I can go farther back. The case that I spoke about um, at the beginning of this program, um, I've never seen this before, but uh, she actually had a uh, vaccines for life. Um, so I don't know if it was a monthly program or she paid some. I think she paid some dollar amount in the beginning, and it was vaccines for life for this. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Carrie looks like she's about to black. <laughs> um, but anyway, I couldn't find any other uh, causative reason for this dog to have to get mast cell cancer just all of a sudden and then a recurrence. And then the recurrence occurred, like, I think within a month um, of the, um, the the free shots that the dog didn't need. Yeah, real free, wasn't it? Yeah, super well, free. not at all, unfortunately. Right. Well, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but um, there there is absolutely no studies that ever suggested that annual vaccination is necessary, right. efficacious, or um, in any way helpful to animals. In any, in, in other words, what has been shown more, especially through Ron Schultz, that it, it's likely to be harmful. Absolutely, and we know a lot of autoimmune diseases that can arise out of that as well. But there can are you imagine if vaccinated cancers. humans this often. If humans went and got, you know, a flu well, vaccine, every companies are trying. <laughs> so they're, they're trying really hard. So yeah, I have to um, go get a COVID booster next year. So <laughs> hold on, we don't don't say. Well, I mean, animals are getting like their tele vaccines, for example. I just did a podcast with somebody else who brought me on their show, and we talked about how often the board of televaccine is given because uh, boarding facilities just go, well, we want to protect ourselves. So they're shoving board of televaccine down these dogs necks every six months, just so they can protect their facilities. And I'm like, you're actually making your facility the problem. Like you're not, you're, oh, I, we can go on that forever, but no, that's that <laughs> one of the vaccinations that hasn't been found to be very helpful at all. If anything, Reduce the symptoms a little bit, and I say might, but more often than not, it'll induce uh, kennel cough. Uh, more yeah, often it's just sad. Let's we're going to shift a little bit because we're up at our six o'clock hour, and I don't want to miss um, getting to Jerry a little bit because we know we need to change the laws. That's what we're working on. We know that our listeners and pet parents need to be their advocates. They need to get those records. Lauren can't help you if she doesn't have the best records at all. And ask for video before you leave. Because if you ask for, and just ask the girl up in front, do you guys have video? And she may just tell you yes. And if she says yes, and then the vet tells you later no, you've got even that alone, right, Lauren? Uh, uh, suddenly there's no video? Yeah. You know, so you want to ask if you have video. You want to ask for your records immediately. You want to be your pet advocate you're going to have to ask never ever ever vaccinate your dog if he's in there for any kind of sickness dr casanero says she has it on her website that you can go to Lori will type in your website we'll have all that information for you that any of these conditions on her website do not vaccinate your dog it may seem like an easy thing to do you're already there it's way more convenient but health is not convenient you need to work to keep a healthy animal so don't you know yeah, please, please do don't. everything yeah please don't also, I mean, so many times that, um, the point your dog is due for X, Y, Z, bring it in. Yeah. And now you've, you've just pumped a bunch of. Yeah. I know. We, we need to um, stop. I, but. I also want your listeners to know um, that in the state of Florida and this, and many states have this, but at least the state of Florida, if your pet is not well enough to receive a rabies vaccination as a licensed veterinarian, we can write an exemption letter for your pet. You can tag, you can still get a license. This yep. is a hidden, hidden, hidden secret in veterinary medicine. It shouldn't be. So you need to be an advocate. If your pet has any of the listed symptoms or uh, disease website, ask for an exemption letter. You're entitled to one. And if that, that won't give it to you, go to another one. Good. If you are that attached to your veterinarian, please understand that uh, number one should be the advocacy for your pet. Our personalities, feelings being hurt is, is you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's important that you, get what you need um, and yeah. that you move on to the person that can fulfill those needs for you. Um, yeah. found because word, word of mouth is a good way to find somebody good. If it doesn't work out for you, keep moving on. And don't yeah. vaccinate when your pet is ill for any reason. And please don't vaccinate your pet at the same time they're having a surgical procedure. Oh, please that's it. Oh, that yeah. either. 
Uh, I don't care if it's a yes. dental, a spay, a neuter. I don't care what it is. Have them vaccinated at the same time as anesthesia. So don't, don't anyway. knock down three times and four times. You can't protect. I love vets used to the vets. Some of the vets I used to work for used to tell clients they can't come in here unless they're protected with the disease. So I have to give them the vaccine while they're getting neutered, which wouldn't <laughs> even work. Oh gosh, well, that's, that's the one. Oh, <laughs> right, people are starting to learn that it takes time to build your antibodies, so you can't just Absolutely. vaccinate. It just doesn't make sense. So don't no let your okay. zero. Yeah, don't. It's too much no stress. Too much same stress. Day. Never will be, never has been. That's yeah. immunology 101. It usually takes, generally speaking, at least 10 days uh, to 14 days for a vaccination to produce antibodies. Yeah. To produce antibodies. I also want your listeners to know carefully, listen carefully. If I give a vaccination, it does not guarantee that your pet is immune. If I do a blood titer, that gives a suggestion that there may have been a production um, of immunity against that particular disease. So don't assume just because the they are immune. Yeah. yeah, tell people that and they can't believe it. And I said, oh yeah, there's probably thousands of animals walking around right now that aren't even immune to rabies and parvo, and but they've been vaccinated. And they're like, what? Like, yeah, you, how would you know? You have to run the titer. So anyway, okay, we're going to shift this over to you, Jerry, here. So we know we need to get this documentary made because if we can't get more information out there to people, we can't get the laws changed, which is the goal here is to change um, the laws so that our pets are seen as more than property so that we can go after some of these bad actors in veterinary medicine and be able to have a little bit stronger voice against veterinary malpractice. So we're trying to raise money for the documentary. Jerry, can you tell us where we are with that? We're, um, uh, John before the filmologist, he uh, contacted Scott and I this week and did a couple, couple of little Zoom casts that he's editing now in public, public service announcements, which we hope are going to go on some TV stations. But uh, be perfectly honest, the donations are slow. Uh, we're up to about 30,000, I think, and we need 100,000. 100, at least that's the quote. Um, and, and it seems that, that, as I've said before, maybe 50 people that are real active off Joey's legacy in this. And I kind of hate for them to carry the load. I think if we could get in touch with other animal advocacy groups, um, they might be willing to donate. But this is an opportunity to. We can, we can go to legislators, legislators. We can call state senators and state congressmen try to get the law changed. And maybe in 15 years it will be changed. But, but if we can get a document on the History Channel, PBS, the, the big channels, it could happen a lot quicker. Uh, once the, the uh, pressure, pressure is put on these veterinary, veterinary boards, which is a swamp in itself from everything I've been reading, and Florida seems to have an awful lot of mal med uh, veterinary malpractice cases too, by the way. Um, if we could get I know, I've, been, I've noticed that myself. Yeah, yeah. If we could get the documentary produced as, as soon as possible, and I would think that uh, if the money comes in, uh, we should be able to do that. that in 2022, and we get that out to the people and the public, um, things are going to change. Things will change quickly. Uh, once it gets out there, because this documentary doesn't, we won't run once. It'll run weekly, or it'll run monthly. It'll, it'll run be run over and over by whatever channels uh, buy it. But um, we're the ones that can make it happen. Uh, nobody else is going to. I think that if we can get some um, horse people involved, uh, I've got a, I've got a story coming in from Australia about a horse veterinarian, and I think if we could get. Um, what? stables involved there are people out there that have bigger wallets and some people we've gotten a lot of twenty dollar donations from people that i know really can't afford twenty dollars uh, um, we've also got dollar donations so there is a there is a silver lining in the cloud but we need to get on the stick yeah we need to we need to raise a hundred thousand dollars so there's ways we're doing that. Of course, you can right, go on to Joey's Legacy's Facebook page. I have it on mine. Also, Amazon Smile. Every time you buy 
anything. You don't even have to do a dang thing different. You just buy on Amazon, you sign up under Smile, and it, Joey's Legacy is a 501c. So it may seem minimal to you that it's a dollar, but it, it just keeps adding up and adding up. And some of these people shop on Amazon all the time. So oh. I know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've personally paid Amazon's electric bill for at least two months over the well, last year. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm, I'm, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm rivaling you on that one. <laughs> and that's all you do is just spend a few minutes, go to smile. And every time you purchase something that, that a dollar or two will go into Joey's legacy and you'll never even have to think about it again. It's so simple to do that. Jerry, do you have a, um, this Jerry, I, I run a five and three. And yeah, let me see. Yeah, let me say something else, Carrie, if I could, but before this is over. Uh, I would like to give a special thanks to the attorneys that are members of Joey's Legacy. Uh, a lot of them make quite generous donations. And I really appreciate it. And Scott really appreciates it. Thank you guys for what you're doing. Did you hear all that? You there? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think you're breaking up a little bit, but yes, he, he wants to make sure if you guys didn't hear it, he wants to thank, he knows the attorneys and the veterinarians are, are also donating not only their time, but also their money as well to help get this going, which just speaks volumes when you think about how hard, like Lauren had said, how hard it is for a veterinarian to speak up and say, this is happening in my industry and I did this because I love animals. So I'm not going to let this happen. And I mean, it's huge to do that. I mean, people don't even want to talk bad about the restaurant down the street. Can you imagine, you know, what you're saying when you're saying that, that a veterinarian may be guilty of veterinary malpractice. It's really, it's a really difficult thing. And so you know, we just the law, like the actual law, I mean, we're not talking about county ordinances, but changing the actual, like, Florida constitute like every state has its own constitution just like changing a law in the, the state constitution is millions of dollars because you have to have 75 percent of the registered voters of the state and then there are people who when you're filling out have you ever gone to the law you you know uh i don't know and out there there are people that are like sign this petition sign this petition they have to have a um, almost a million dollars worth of those people put the wrong date or birthday. Like that's how you change a lot. It is expensive making yeah. what you're doing with the video and, or the, the, the documentary and getting, get, changing people's minds by, by educating them is going to be such a more effective way to push legislators into, into proffering new bills and legislation to, to make change versus us trying to as citizens. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's it truly has to be made. Uh, we have the book that the books actually that Jerry Robert, he already has published one, but he is uh, going to be doing another second, a third, a fourth. We talk about it all the time that he could probably do a hundred of these books. And it's very, very sad. I'm going to wrap this up, but before I do, I, I want to always remind people, not that we don't know why we're here, but we know we're here for the animals. Ultimately, we are here to help the animals that go through this and the grieving and the process that the pet owners have to go through to do this. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about Luke. And I'm just going to really quickly read this. I, I don't know if Luke's parents are listening to this, but all of the stories in here are so hard to read. And so I try to read a little bit um, all the time. But this one says that after careful review of his medical records by an independent veterinarian. It was presumed that during a procedure to tend to his wound, Luke was given a series of sedatives and anesthetics when the initial dose of sedatives did not take effect quickly enough to control him, he was given more. The combination administered intramuscularly proved to be fatal. With no reversal agent administered, no monitoring of airway support in place, his unconscious body was left in a kennel where he presumed suffocated and he was later found dead. There is nothing that can prepare you for an event like this. And then his mom writes, my sunshine doesn't come from the skies. It comes from the light in my dog's eyes. You will forever be in my light, my love, my Luke. And she says, thank you for reading this. 
So I just, I know that people think that malpractice won't happen to you. And I have said this with Dr. Dobbs before, there's a good chance it already has. I think Dr. Canzanera has told you that, that when your pets are being vaccinated, when they're unhealthy, that is in our eyes, a form of malpractice. It may not be something that we can fight, but these kind of things are happening all the time. And mm -hmm. so we need to keep the fight going for these dogs. And um, so I just, I'm going to end there and thank you guys so very much for your time and your knowledge and your expertise and your willingness to keep doing this every week and fight with us. It means so much. It means so much to these animals. All right. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Huh. Thank you so much for having me on again. I, I learned a lot, uh, Dr. Canzanera. It doesn't matter, I think, how long I do this. It's, every time I come on this podcast, it's really educational for me, too. And and and, and you taught me a lot today, too. So it's yeah. incredibly, your time is so incredibly valuable. It's it's 920 for me tonight. I know it's probably 920 for you, too, if, if you're in the same oh, segment. Yeah, so, yeah you know, when it, I'm on Eastern. Thank you. And uh, I, I, you know, knowledge is power. And please educate yourself. Please be an advocate for your pet. Um, get to know more than you should know about what maybe should and shouldn't be done. And look to a homeopathic, holistic veterinarian to help guide you. We are probably the most holistic um, that are out there. And it's not that we're right about everything, um, but we've got a broader you may or may not be able to do differently. Um, that could make all the difference. And I appreciate yep. everybody on the panel. Um, Jerry, Absolutely. you've been super duty, super duty patient, important and valuable part of this. Thank you all so much. I appreciate your having me and I enjoy participating. I, a topic that's so difficult. Um, I, I just was moved to tears about uh, Luke's story. I, I yeah. can't help but not be moved to tears. Yeah. For that. yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, keep it up. I will see you, you next week, I guess. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, Bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hey, Be healthy. You too, everybody. <laughs>